Welcome to CAM Radio, an ahead of the curve initiative by Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas, bringing you every Friday the latest in legal and policy. Stay tuned, enjoy listening. Good afternoon, Mr. Shroff and Mr. Roy. It's a privilege to have you uh, on this podcast and also to have an opportunity to discuss this very important, relevant topic today. Uh, the institution of independent directors has been entrenched in our regulations uh, since many years now. But what we've seen now is the coming of age of this institution. Long gone are the days when the role that the that the regulator imposed on the independent directors was seen as undue pressure and responsibility on independent directors. The independent directors have weathered the pressure. They have made themselves heard and relevant in various boards. And today they are front and center of large listed companies. Uh, their importance cannot be denied by the regulators, the management, the promoters, the sponsors. So it becomes very important now to discuss what next for this institution. What can be done to strengthen it? And what can they do to strengthen the governance framework in this country? In this spirit, I think I'll go into the first question that I have is that there is no denying to the fact that the independent directors have a strong voice on the boards. Audit committees of large listed companies comprise only independent directors now and our audit committees have very very expansive role in the uh, in, in in the future of companies they play a role on the finance side they play a role on the strategic side they play a very important role on the compliance side as well where we are today how did we reach was it the regulatory framework that pushed this was it the market forces and what are the lessons and learnings that we have from this so that we can actually have the right incentives built in to make this institution better. Mr. Roy, if I can start with you on this, given your significant experience of being independent director on various large listed companies. Good afternoon, Anjal. Uh, it's a, a privilege to be uh, here on this uh, radio show uh, talking on uh, the very, I, what I consider very important and critical uh, role of independent directors on boards. Uh, for me, it's a little, um, uh, at times I look at myself and I f- feel strange uh, coming from the background that I do, uh, long uh, civil service in the police particularly and uh, now on uh, corporate boards and including, as you mentioned, on a number of audit committees. Uh, so yes, I, I do uh, see this um, uh, emerging uh, role of independent directors in governance of uh, company boards. Uh, we have reached here largely uh, driven by regulation over time. However, uh, market forces and the overall what are happenings in the ecosystem, uh, the incident that happened with a few companies, uh, some uh, serious misgovernance, uh, malfeasance uh, that were noticed in companies, etc. have all contributed to this. Uh, initially, there would have been definitely a reluctance on the part of uh, independent directors taking on this uh, very high level, heavy burden of uh, governance and compliance on their uh, shoulders, uh, particularly in respect of uh, audit committees, etc., audit related uh, matters. But now I do see that we have come of age uh, largely. Uh, It is uh, true, as you mentioned, that uh, now in large listed companies, at least uh, the, uh, in, the audit committees are required to be comprising of only independent directors. I'm not sure that's the uh, best solution uh, because I have uh, seen both sides even before this, this regulation came with two third uh, independent directors and one third uh, executive, uh, non-independent. Uh, there is some merit in having some representation of non-independent director on the audit committee. Be that as it may, we have, uh, we have this regulation now. So all are independent directors. Uh, but the burden of compliance on audit committees is increasing by the day uh, from multiple regulators, not only one, uh, multiple regulators. So uh, that is definitely where the independent directors have to be very aware, uh, very ready, uh, prepared to play a role very responsibly, very seriously, 
it is not only audit is a name but not only audit it has very serious uh, strategic uh, uh, requirements it has um, in fact <laughs> you would sound strange but even something like the posh committees and the um, uh, 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 disciplinary matters all of this fall somehow under the uh, audit committee uh, purview and hence the burden of uh, responsibilities is he heavy uh, on the uh, this it is still an evolving situation uh, every day uh, regulations new regulations and depending on new either uh, judicial pronouncements or to new regulations or new incidents happening anywhere uh, is all continuously evolving changing uh, additional uh, uh, burden coming uh, there are a lot of learnings uh, every single incident that happens anywhere in any other uh, company in the overall ecosystem uh, brings some lessons i am sure uh, we do uh, in companies that i uh, represent uh, we do review all matter that happen around in the system uh, in any other company somewhere or uh, any uh, judicial uh, bodies that come so we review all of that and try and see whether there are any lessons for us that will have to be an ongoing uh, evolving process uh, very dynamic uh, we need to i would also say one more thing here that uh, this whole idea the, the regulation is largely on account for the listed companies however even the unlisted companies uh, will need to willingly be ready for similar level of uh, compliance on these major issues major uh, regulatory matters uh, even if there may not be a strict stipulation for them uh, but the direction is the same they better be ready uh, even before the uh, regulation uh, demands it mandates it for them uh, there are many matters where we have seen uh, where the uh, burden of such regulations compliance is taken very lightly by management by boards by promoters and we have seen very serious uh, malfeasance at times serious incidents happening uh, in such companies and then uh, you have chaos and then you will have then regulation will follow etc so to my mind it, we should uh, conceptually uh, not seriously distinguish between listed and unlisted the message from the regulator is the same to improve governance uh, from the board through the board through the independent directors particularly and that both the board and the independent directors particularly must understand that and take that role seriously sure mr roy thank you so much mr shrov just a question coming from this discussion for you there are a lot of protections under the law for independent director liability so the liability driver which earlier was thought as the main driver for independent directors being proactive did not have as much footing and we we seen from a practical standpoint as well that the regulator has been sensible and not prosecuted in independent directors in very serious matters as well because they understood that uh, the independent directors are not involved in the day to day management so is it that the market forces also played an important role in bringing the institution where it is today because the traditional thought process on liability uh, actually could be said to have been a very theoretical concept so to say i think there is a very complex and a nuanced answer to this question because it is a number of factors that have contributed to the evolution uh, and maturity of this institution but before i squarely answer this question i want to build on a little bit of what uh, anami said in terms of unlisted companies i think the real test of where you apply the standards is whether you are using third party funds now in a listed company there is uh, obviously lot of public funds including retail but even in unlisted company which are particularly in the startup and upwards to the unicorn space and they will eventually get listed the governance journey starts a lot before the listing moment and in anticipation of that day there is a lot of uh, institutional money private equity vcs others who have come in uh, and they also have similar expectations uh, in relation to governance so i think the lens should be of third party funds uh, and not just whether you are listed or not which is a technicality of course an important one because a new different legal regime um, really comes in now it's very interesting how 
the role of independent director has evolved in india because india is one of the few jurisdictions in the world which still has the promoter concept and a lot of the initial journeys uh, and conversations were about independence from the promoter uh, and therefore almost like a check and balance to ensure no conflicts of interest uh, and to keep a kind of a watchdog eye uh, on the promoter but i think that has uh, that conversation has evolved uh, significantly it is not about uh, a kind of a them versus us uh, format of promoter and we are the uh, uh, we are the us it is more about uh, just responsible governance to the entire not only the entire body of shareholders but all the other stakeholders as well under section 166 now you have uh, the responsibility of your board not not just to the shareholders but to a number of other constituents including the community and the environment so uh, the uh, as a logical consequence of the movement away from the pure shareholder model of governance to the stakeholder model of governance which applies both to unlisted and listed companies is the uh, intellectual uh, evolution of the concept of what is the role uh, of a board and therefore of the independent directors this independence is really a, a little bit of a state of mind and a little bit of a state a state of fact but uh, at the end of the day all directors are directors and they have a fiduciary obligation uh, to the company now in india we've had the new companies act we've had satyam we've had uh, so many you know uh, scandals and more recently most of the scandals have been in unlisted companies uh strangely enough i mean if you look at decade ago you found big, some of the bigger incidents that occurred for listed companies more recently they have been in unlisted companies principally because there is always some form of agency conflict whether the agency conflict is vis a vis the promoter or the agency conflict is in relation to super boards uh is a very fact specific thing uh all in all summarizing this journey i think uh independent directors positions are now taken uh, taken seriously they are an uncomfortable place to be i mean there was a noted jurist who said that the, the true test of a board is that independent or the directors not just independent directors are always uncomfortable if they are too comfortable there is a problem so uh, the, i think the learnings now really result in almost like we are in a new era of independent directors to point to Thank you, Mr. Shroff. Thank you, Mr. Roy, for bringing in uh, the, uh, the the unique issues that arise in unlisted companies. And I would suspect that we are talking about uh, these very large startups who are no longer actually startups, are very you know in their own way matured businesses, and where we've seen large governance concerns coming in. So my question is actually on that: is that whether you see it in listed or unlisted space there are a lot of financial institutions who are now sponsors and promoters of companies they play a very important role in these companies and the growth of these companies a number of companies are also promoter less companies because they from even prior to the listing have a very diverse set of shareholders they of course on one side create um these uh, a, a very important and a highly valuable value proposition Uh, a lot of them have a large governance premiums also attached to them by not having something called a promoter cost attached to <clears throat> such company the companies and the governance structures but the question is that while on one side they create you know opportunities and and are a huge value proposition do they create uh, a very different set of challenges for being an independent director on boards of such companies are there any different skill sets required to actually be an independent director on a company where you don't have a sponsor to look up to or a, or 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 a very specific set of individuals on the board and it's the independent directors who are actually in the lead is it a is it is it is it a unique situation to be an independent director on these is it a is it a great place to be in or is it does it create unique challenges of its own mr roy if we can start with you Uh, so uh, a, a great question, and at a very critical time uh, to raise this question. Actually, uh, very important. Uh, and uh, so, to my mind, uh, the role of independent directors 
uh, whether a listed company or an unlisted company conceptually should not be different. The independent director's mindset should be of the same for both. He must go, to, he or she must go to the board with full responsibility of looking at the best uh, governance structure, compliances, everything that you have. The burden only in terms of reporting, etc., may be lighter. But the principle, as Cyril earlier uh, enunciated, uh, is the same. Uh, it is these practices, particularly like he mentioned, one ex example, one specific thing is the related party transaction. Now, one point I want to clarify, uh, Anshul, that I don't want to go uh, to a, a stage that we, there's some conception that uh, the promoter-led companies perhaps uh, are more prone uh, to any uh, lack of compliance, lack of governance, uh, malfeasance uh, in any matter. I don't subscribe to that. It can happen to promoter-led companies. It can happen to non-promoter-led institutional held um, uh, companies as well. So the uh, boards and the independent directors more so must look at uh, the fundamental compliance uh, uh, matters equally firmly even in uh, unlisted companies or promoter-led or uh, the startup um, ecosystem. Uh, that is where the moment that becomes lax, those eyes become relaxed, that's when you will have malfeasance happening there. So to my mind, uh, I would not like to distinguish from that perspective. There are, the moment you are dealing with public money, money other than that, your own money, you must apply all the same standards. Now, for instance, one example, is this related party transaction? This happens in large listed companies also. And this can happen in any small unlisted promoter led or startup uh, kind of company. Uh, so that is where you need to apply the highest standards of probity there, how the money is being utilized, how transactions between related parties are done, whether individuals or companies within the group. That is a very, very uh, straight and black and white uh, situation to my mind. Uh, the moment you start compromise on that, uh, and the slide is very slippery. Uh, so on that, I would not, for, for instance, uh, if you see the only look at the listed and listed uh, uh, distinction, the RBI as a regulator, for instance, has stricter compliance standards, obviously, for banks. However, they are saying so by not in so many words, but by their uh, actions, very clear indication that the NBFCs also have to willy-nilly uh, come up with the same level of compliance, same regulation as the banks. Today, it is not in writing, not mandated. Tomorrow, it will get mandated. It's already happening to the upper layer um, uh, NBFCs. So the direction to my mind in the terms of compliance is the same, has to be the same. The uh, uh, unlisted companies, the promoter-led companies or startups, uh, they all have to look at that from the same perspective, same prism. You can't make any distinction on that. And so I do see that the independent directors uh, on uh, unlisted companies have, may have, uh, have the risk of uh, being uh, taking it easy, uh, that there's no compliance burden there, but that's, uh, that's where uh, pitfalls uh, lie ahead of you. Uh, that is not in the in respect of governance on these issues cannot uh, be diluted at all. We have seen, one can cite any number of cases, we've all seen around it happening all the time. Uh, and that is where it leads to uh, not only uh, 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 compliance uh, uh, gaps happening, but also fights have uh, uh, gone ahead and bringing the companies down. So that is an area to my mind, very, very clear, black and white to me from the perspective of both the boards as well as the independent directors. Thank you, Mr. Roy. That brings up a very interesting question on compliance. As we've seen, SEBI in its new avatar over the last year or so has brought in a new wave of governance regime, so to say, in India. 
the disclosure and compliance regime, as you mentioned yourself, has become fairly stringent and prescriptive. Uh, it's no longer the responsibility or within the capability of the management to be able to fulfill what SEBI expects without active involvement of the board. In fact, in order to reach that bare minimum, the managements now need an active uh, guidance, uh, involvement, and support of the board. In this scenario, how, how do you see the role of independent directors when it's literally that in the day-to-day -day functioning and decision-making of the company, uh, there is a lot more that needs to be done in order to just be barely in compliance with what SEBI expects. Uh, the, you know, the answer on risk and rewards has, I think, is, is a dated one now. I don't think there can ever be a balance in the risk and rewards for independent directors to do what is required. So what is it that's required uh, to be done? Uh, and what's that balancing act uh, that is required for the boards to be able to effectively lead companies in, in, in substantive uh, and complete compliance of what the regulators expect? Uh, it, 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 it is an extremely heavy burden, as you said, but it's also a burden that has no way out. It needs to be complied with. Are we now going to see uh, independent directors and boards being more actively involved in a lot of this? Or do you believe that, again, there will be some frameworks to be brought in for, and uh, to, for managements to be able to still go ahead and do this? Looks tough, but what are your views on that? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Anshul. Uh there is no uh, denying that the burden of compliance on boards is and independent directors is increasing by the day uh, and in multiple areas, newer areas as well. Newer areas are opening up uh, for uh, compliance uh, from the boards and the accountability is being squarely fixed virtually uh, on a very large number of uh, subjects, items, on the boards and also independent directors and particularly, more particularly on audit committees. Uh, but it also not only SEBI, mind you, uh, even other regulators are adding uh, to that, uh, to that burden, uh, RBI in respect of uh, financial sector, uh, IRD in respect of insurance companies, uh, NAFRA for all the companies. In fact, NAFRA at the moment is uh, a little more aggressive as a regulator uh, uh, than many uh, newer, so they are bringing in newer and newer. The latest that compliance burden has come uh, for uh, companies and independent directors and the audit committee, chairman audit committee in particular is the, uh, the NAFRA's requirement that as soon as a, a statutory auditor uh, comes to know of any uh, misappropriation, any financial accounting uh, matter, uh, adverse notice, whether noticed by them directly or brought to their notice even by the management, they must be within a very short stipulated time, within two days, they are supposed to write a personal communication to the chairman audit committee, who is supposed to respond to every fact brought in the, uh, brought to the, his notice, his or her notice uh, in the uh, communication, respond to it uh, categorically within 45 days, and within two days thereafter, he, Statutory auditors are expected to bring it to the report it to the government of India. Now, all of this put together is a huge ask from the chairman of audit committee, from the management. All of this puts a very heavy burden of compliance on the com on the management. For instance, it's not nothing wrong. Compliance is needed, and it is with good intent. However, the uh, demand on the management bandwidth on their time uh, requirement to respond to all of this. So it, this is a huge ask. And like this, there are many such requirements. So the burden is increasing. But the point is, what we need, the solution from the perspective of solution, I would say, what we need most is to create that whole com total compliance culture. It's not a question of responding to one particular thing to do this or don't do this. It's an overall compliance culture needs to be created from bottom to up. It has to start from the top. Once the uh, CEO of the company acquires, uh, uh, brings it in within himself, he will pass it on naturally by his normal behavior. Now his own uh, expectation. It it has to come. The compliance culture has to be brought in. The board requirement, particularly, 
will be that the board needs to bring in place a proper framework which has which creates a total compliance you need to create your own dashboard i am not being prescriptive here but the fact is that you need to create a mechanism where you will be able to ensure compliance and that the board will be able to monitor a uh, board oversight over the compliance and total compliance in all areas need to be created there is no prescription given by the regulator for this the board will have to evolve it for however the regulator do want that there will be a board approved policy for this board approved policy for this everything has to be a board approved policy so that the board has applied its mind you have created a mechanism and that you have a monitoring mechanism so that is what will need to be brought in hmm. uh, independent director obviously has a great greatest role in this, uh, to play so there is a, a big uh, ask on this on the independent directors the risk assessment the risk management is another very powerful area very critical area in this risk management is not a matter of only the risk management committee the entire board is equally responsible for that so this is a continuous exercise that the board needs to look at from the perspective all even the compliance lack of compliance also a risk issue and that is that is something that the board needs to very seriously apply itself independent directors have the greatest role in this on this issue of risk and reward uh, anchal that's something to me uh, uh, it's a non issue I, I, once you have accepted the responsibility there's risk in built in that whether you joined it for a reward is something that i don't even want to go there uh, the issue in principle yes if the independent directors are contributing giving in terms of their time in terms of their skill in terms of experience and getting uh, accepting the accountability yeah, they need to be compensated in whatever form uh, monetary non monetary they need to be compensated that's another area but it cannot be kind of there cannot be a balance it cannot be equated risk and reward uh, kind of uh, compensation uh, mechanism that's not the uh, area i would want to look at i would definitely want that the independent directors when they accept this they should accept the challenge within in its entirety there is a serious responsibility required you have to accept it and deliver main thing that yes you create a platform to um, a dashboard a mechanism yes yes a total compliance culture has to be so uh, it's about risk and responsibility and no risk and rewards mr shroff a question that comes out from this for you in the context of the recent lodr amendments that sebi has brought in we of course have you know as practitioners have the instant reaction and also the concerns that the industry and management have expressed but from a board perspective how do you what do you believe and especially independent directors perspective how do you, what do you believe would be the right reaction to this do you actually believe this is an opportunity to take companies to the next level or do you believe that um, uh, you know this is again something that needs to be looked at at something that needs to be managed somehow uh, but is not as effective how do how would how should independent directors view this significant change in the governance framework that has brought in so the recent changes particularly on uh, disclosure i think they take uh, things to the next level now there is a perception that this has increased the uh, the burden too much and that the pendulum has swung too far i think there will be some kind of moderation uh, in terms of uh, kind of relief in terms of making it practical uh, but i i don't doubt the intention uh, behind it i think the intention was to move corporate governance for uh, india to the next level and the reason for that was that in the in the emerging india shining story uh, capital formation is going to be uh, essential and attracting foreign capital is going to be very uh, very critical india does not have the resources for the full india shining story amrit kal story whatever you want to call it so i think it's a step in the right direction uh, there are portions of it which Uh, perceived to have gone uh, too far but i think they will auto correct in terms of coming down to a level that uh, would become kind of reasonable and capable of compliance because the last thing that you want is uh, if a regulation becomes incapable of uh, of compliance and people will just not comply with it because it's just and that's not a, that's not what i think the regulatory 
uh, system wants. At the end of the day, I think in the overall political economy philosophy, I think ease of doing business will prevail over some of this. So there is a, there are competing priorities, but ease of doing business, especially in the state that India is now, will I think be the trump card. That's my view in terms of where direction is headed. And it's not just the LODR. I think we are seeing this across a number of other regulators and systems as well. The system is tightening up. And sometimes when you tighten the system and make a step change, uh, there are unintended consequences. And that's what we are going through now. I think it is work in progress. And I would expect that in the coming weeks, months, whatever it is, that they will be uh, finishing and... Uh, fine-tuning to make it practical, but at the same time, fundamentally having lifted the standards. Anshul, uh, one, uh, I just want to add one thing to this. Uh, from my own personal experience, uh, on, an, uh, on a financial sector company, uh, on the board of which I am, and I also chair the audit co uh, committee there, when we get these most difficult and very expansive kind of uh, new regulations coming, uh, sometimes you feel that, yes, it is uh, kind of you know, becoming a little obstructive, very too prescriptive, etc. But I find that the CEO of the company, when we all discuss this, he comes up at the end and says, but sir, this is actually, you know, I look at it as a great opportunity. Because going forward, all these things are going to come in handy. If we are prepared today, tomorrow we will not have a problem. So it's a matter of perspective. As uh, uh, Cyril rightly said, it's an evolving situation. Over time, it might get moderated. Once we comply, we, our general level of compliance goes up. Uh, definitely some moderation may happen. But yes, it's a matter of perspective how we look at it. If we look at it as an enabling thing, as something that's good for us in the future, uh, it will uh, do good uh, to us. Thank you, Mr. Roy and Mr. Shrav. I think that's a very important messaging for the market. How would you see the role of management uh, and sponsors in supporting and contributing to uh, to taking the institution of independent directors to the next level? Because we've spoken about how independent directors have gone through a stage of uh, you know uh, learnings, and there's, there's a huge amount of maturity that has come into the institution of independent directors. What kind of support? Uh, do they need from companies and promoters to take this to the next level? I do see that there is uh, some uh, improvement has happened uh, on boards in terms of quality of independent directors. However, I very strongly feel that we need to do a lot more in that space. Uh, in every large company board, particularly, we do need to identify, there are some uh, recommendations, some, uh, not exactly regulation, but there are recommendations in this regard. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the recommendations have come up from the uh, committee in which uh, Cyril was also involved. Areas of expertise for the uh, independent, for the directors on the board need to be highlighted, identified, and we must look for people with that a background, that specialization, uh, to come and represent someone, if it's a IT company where you have a large uh, IT uh, support uh, required, somebody from the IT, somebody from agriculture sector, somebody from expo. So that is where uh, I am not sure we have reached there. There is a, a big potential to improve on the quality of uh, directors on the board in terms of the specializations required for the running of the, for the better governance of the company. Also that... Uh, the uh, the way the independent uh, the directors are identified for the board that also some more professionalism uh, some more uh, meritocracy need to be added there uh, i am not sure we are in the best situation it has definitely improved over what it used to be say two decades ago but yes we still need to have uh, we need to we have a lot of ground to cover in that respect i would want to add that uh, the diversity on boards is another area, diversity on boards and lead further on the senior management. Uh, we need to look at very seriously to create better diversity. For instance, what many times we are just sort of checking boxes. The regulation has provided some, yes, you need to have this, you need to have one uh, woman board, uh, woman director on the board. So we are just checking boxes, just managed to have one. Now, 
same thing goes down in respect of diversity on in various uh, spaces uh, we are not looking at enriching uh, the overall uh, board as well as the senior management in terms of diversity i would not uh, i would not <laughs> really uh, see that uh, we can't find enough uh, competent uh, expertise uh, among uh, different diverse groups of people i recall this uh, comment coming from this uh, late supreme court a very legendary supreme court judge of us what was the pbg rbg 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 yes so once once she was asked uh, are you happy with the diversity on the supreme court she said no was so she said how many would you like so if the supreme court of us is nine seater so she said till we have nine now uh, it is just to say just a um, illustration we do need to create greater diversity in our board both in terms of uh, in terms of everything uh, gender uh, other diverse groups uh, expertise of different areas so that is as a space we are still not uh, fully there and uh, we need to have a uh, create uh, that uh, more and more uh, the process for um, uh, this also uh, the support for this also needs to come from management uh, from the promoter group uh, to look for the best talent to support them fully to be able to deliver now obviously independent directors at in many places depending on the uh, promoters you would find that yes people feel that oh, how can i say this how can i not say this it cuts both ways the promoters must create that environment uh, of a uh, total independence uh, autonomy for the uh, independent directors to perform but irrespective of that the independent directors have to take it upon themselves that yes they have a role to play irrespective of what um, uh, is how it is looked upon by the other side but they need to make have greater involvement make contribution you are here to play that role so it's a uh, it's a given take you have to evolve that situation but the promoter and management have definitely some role to play to create a conducive environment but the larger burden always lies on the independent director to play that role on boards thank you mr roy i think <clears throat> one point that mr shroff made earlier about you know it's no longer us versus them and i think it is important for this to be you know more effective than it was in the past and i think probably now is the case to be made for professional independent directors right who come with the right amount of training commitment and authority to get the job done um and in that spirit uh, you know what more can be done uh, can be done by the regulator um, or is it that we have we have we've gone past what regulatory pressures they could be and now this is more a value proposition that to have better value to have a better governance premium it's important that there is a very balanced set of independent directors who are leading the company uh, do you believe we are there and what needs to be done to reach that state mr shroff if you have any views on that uh, i think it's work in progress but we are getting there now if i were to take a i would do a comparison between 10 years ago and now the uh, the universe of what you are calling professional independent directors is significantly larger uh not only numerically but also in terms of the sheer confidence uh and the uh, gumption that independent directors have to exercise their role so the joke in the past uh, used to be that they are called cashew nut directors and they only open their mouth when they have to eat a cashew nut uh but that is no longer the case now they i think the concept of a lead independent director uh the roles and responsibilities that regulation has put including you know by things like the quota committee report and the recent changes that have been made i think there is a step evolution have we perfected the concept of a professional independent director no i i personally feel we are kind of 50 60% uh, along the way but um, uh, may the tribe increase and i think part of the uh, hold back on increasing the the the, the universe has been liability i think there has been a lot of in the maybe 5 6 years ago there was a lot of concern about liability is it even worth being on boards in terms of the risk reward and you know do you want to get a a knock on the door at midnight from some agency because you were on the board and there have been many instances like that 
so but uh, more recently we've seen the regulatory agencies uh, pull back a little bit i think they have recognized that uh, independent directors are not in the day to day management and absence actual factual malfeasance they should be left alone because otherwise you're kind of throwing the baby out with the bath water you're making uh, the independent directors also responsible but guess what they're all running away so that has corrected a bit but the process is still on i think there is still an element of fear on what am i getting into and unless the company has a you know very strong reputation it has established systems of governance uh, which have been time tested uh, there is always a hesitation by quality directors on coming on board now where does that leave companies which are not at that uh, level but still need independent directors because they still have public funds and they still operate in the market so uh, there is a balance to be struck and i think uh, i would expect it to take another 4 or 5 years before we we find that it's a it's a well settled system but it the direction of travel is clear that in the class of independent directors uh, there is a emerging uh, growth of uh, the tribe thank you Over mr shroff i think that's extremely encouraging uh and i think it's a, with it, it's it's a very good place to be in where there is no questioning of authority but only an expectation that independent directors will play a larger and more effective role in the companies uh and in their governance frameworks any final thoughts mr roy and mr shroff on this topic and i'm really Actually, thankful should, for uh, we should get some suggestions from mr roy in terms of uh governance and shareholder and because he's kind of a, a active citizen of this world and uh, we'd love to get his uh, forward looking suggestions on uh, what is required apart from you know checking the box and compliance and all of that i mean that is important but that i think at one level is hygiene what next mr roy yeah so uh, that's where i seriously look at today what happens mostly on all boards uh, that we are basically uh, getting into only compliance roles uh, what is expected the regulator directs the agenda uh, we are virtually fulfilling that do this do this this compliance this report this um, uh, has to be approved by the board etc and also uh, meeting the basic hygiene requirements almost in uh, every space uh, very little uh, time and in very few companies is really Uh, invested uh, of the board uh, in looking at the strategic direction for the companies from the governance perspective from the performance man- management perspective so that is an area i would really want that the independent directors particularly and the boards in general uh, must invest themselves more in that area i mean for instance look at ultimately as uh, cyril rightly mentioned that we are is not a we versus they situation the board is a board independent or non independent is only an internal classification basically they are all on board equally responsible for the governance and the furtherance of the uh, performance of the company you may have some additional responsibilities inside that's a different area but however you are all meant for the growth and better governance of the company i am not sure we are, for instance see what is the public confidence in generally public listed companies for instance today just once uh, somebody pointed out this uh, to me india is a savings led uh, country we have very large pool of savings happening tell me how much of that is people are feeling confident to invest in public listed companies the moment people see higher levels of governance leading to better growth of companies predictable uh, path uh, ahead it will generate greater confidence in people in terms of to put in their hard earned savings to look at companies the perception of companies will improve the better uh, mutual confidence of the government and the uh, company the regulator and the company will improve we all as mr mentioned a lot of these regulations are coming out of lack of trust between the regulator and the comp- regulated company the company and the uh, different uh, arms of government the company and the banks so we need to create that environment yes of uh, the whole objective of this is to create that raise it to 
higher level of governance create those create greater confidence among people all stakeholder whether it's the shareholder minority or promoter or the government or funding agencies so that responsibility lies entirely on the board and independent directors have a large role to play there to improve the overall general governance standard bring it to newer areas improve there and then you will find there will be a high premium for that so the instead of just limiting yourself to the uh, basic hygiene factor the regulator requires you so we are checking the box so we need this new regulation has come so we are fulfilling and that is what i see largely among most companies just trying to check the right boxes so we need to uplift ourselves from that so a more driver seat role for the uh, independent directors at least for the governance framework of the company oh, thank well, you so much we can call it drivers in whatever it's a it overall it's a all to the i look at the board not only the board as per se the board has to drive this agenda looking at the Absolutely. Long, longer term perspective and that appears to be the regulatory mandate as well so i think there's no escaping that but thank you so much mr roy and thank you so much mr shaw for this very enriching conversation uh, i hope a lot of suggestions that made by you actually see light of the day and we actually see the next time we have this conversation we have even more to talk about in terms of what all the independent directors have done and the institution has reached the next level it needs to reach thank you so much